Well, Sue, thank you very much indeed for reading for us, and uh, may I add my welcome uh, to Paul's. The subject we're going to be considering this morning is something that uh, has fascinated humans down through the ages and absorbed them. Millions of pounds are spent uh, across the world each year seeking to attain it. Numerous have died for it, wars are fought over it, and once achieved, huge effort is expended in seeking to retain it. We're going to be looking at the issue of power. Only our subject is not anything so limited as fleeting, passing, ephemeral, temporary human power over restricted geographical domains. Rather, we are going to consider divine power, ultimate power, and eternal power. And I want us to consider this question, what does genuine, powerful, divinely blessed Christian ministry look like? What is its style? And how does it feel to be part of it? Uh, last week in this uh, two-part series, we looked at the substance of authentic Christian ministry, and this week we're going to look at its style. And our study passage is the passage you just had read um, out of the book that our small groups on Sunday morning are going to be studying uh, this year, and therefore this is something of an introduction to those books and a key place for us to be at the beginning of the year. What does genuine Christian ministry looked like. You'll remember last week that we went back to chapter 5 and verse 12, which I think is probably the key verse that unlocks the whole of this second letter to the Corinthians. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not what is on the heart. So then, what is the ministry that impacts the human heart? What is its substance, and what is its style? What does it look like to be part of a divinely inspired, authentic, powerful ministry from God? Well, last week we saw that the substance is to be found at the cross with all its weakness, apparent weakness, that is the place where God deals with human sin, washes us clean, clothes us in His righteousness, so that made right with God, He can flood His Holy Spirit into our hearts and enable us to begin to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. There's the substance of authentic Christian ministry. It is rooted in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, God made him sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. But what is the style or the shape of a ministry whose core has to do with the cross? The paradox of divine power. I want us to grasp that God's mighty power rests on, is experienced in, the context of weakness and frailty. Can I say that again? God's mighty power rests on and is experienced in the context of human frailty and weakness. Because the substance of real Christian ministry has to do with the cross of Christ, crucified in weakness, so true Christian ministry and true Christian experience will always be embodied in human weakness. In fact, I want to go a little bit further than that. I want us to see that when God works in mighty power, he deliberately acts to ensure that the humans through whom he works appear weak, frail, and inadequate. 
and he does so to ensure that it is self-evidently his power and his power alone that is behind what is being done, and to make sure that we, in our human weakness, resort to dependence upon him. Now, that point lies right at the heart of the passage we just had read. It comes in the summary statement in chapter 12, verse 9, where you will see, just over the page there, on page uh, 1,168, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You see it again in the so that, at the end of verse 9, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And you see it again at the end of verse 10, for... When I am weak, then I am strong. But it's not just in verses 9 and 10 of this full speech that we're going to be looking at a, a little more detail in a few moments. All the way through the letter, we see that God deliberately acts to keep his servants weak so that the power in his work might be self-evidently his power and so that we, as it were, are driven to our knees in our Christian life and ministry and depend entirely upon him. God does it. He deliberately works like that to keep us on our knees. And it's, I want to say, unless we grasp this lesson, we will never understand the experience of Christian living and Christian ministry, and we will never be content with genuine Christian ministry. We'll always be casting around for something else that looks more powerful or appears stronger, something other than the cross of Jesus and the ministry whose style is modeled after it. Let's just see it elsewhere in the letter. You'll come across this if you're studying it this year. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul runs through his travel plans... And it seems that the Corinthians, who don't like this weak ministry, as they see it, are criticizing Paul because he keeps changing his travel plans. Now, look at chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we, we nearly died. We despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But, now notice the cause... That was to make us rely, not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God deliberately acted to keep Paul on his knees so that he was dependent upon the Lord. Turn over to chapter 4, verse 7. You'll find this second causal clause. There are three of them in 2 Corinthians that helps us to see this key paradox where Paul talks famously about uh, the gospel, treasure. It is through the gospel message of the cross that people have themselves put right with God. God's spirit floods into our lives and we live in a life put right with God. But, says Paul, we have this glorious treasure in clay pots. And the clay pot was just the everyday item that you used to keep a lamp in, a little lantern, and they were to a penny. They were consumer, whatever they are, expendables, whatever you call them, not consumer durables, like the little plastic cups we're going to be drinking out afterwards. And Paul says, you know, God has put the message in me, a plastic cup. And now notice why he's done it, verse 8, uh, no, verse 7, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So God acts deliberately to keep you and me weak in ministry so that it might be seen to his power and his power alone that is at work. It's not just a lesson that you find in 2 Corinthians, is it? All the way through the Bible. I mean, think of Gideon. 
where Gideon announces, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And remember how God then reduces Gideon's army to just 300 against the swarming hordes of the Midianites in order to show that all power belongs to him and to cause Gideon to fall on his knees and depend upon God. Think of David, the youngest of all the sons of Jesse, a mere shepherd boy, approaching the Philistine Goliath and announcing, you come to me with sword, shield, and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel. Weak, feeble, a mere child, all power belonging to God. And think ultimately, as we have been this morning, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified in weakness. Here then is the paradox of divine power, that God's mighty power is demonstrated and experienced in the context of abject human weakness. When God works in his mighty power, he deliberately acts to ensure that the agents through whom he works appear weak and frail, so that we seek him and we discover my grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. Now, this means then that our experience of Christian ministry and of genuine Christian living will often seem weak, will regularly appear inadequate and will look to some unspiritual, will rarely catch the eye or fascinate the intellect or titillate the interest either of the world or of worldly Christians because obviously the world is looking for things that impress, that look powerful. Now, at this point, um, I want us to look again at the t key section, verses 7 to 10 of chapter 12, and I need to make four qualifying remarks. Please note, qualifying remark number one. Paul is not saying that he deliberately goes out of his way to court weakness and suffering like some sort of masochistic martyr heading out to burn copies of the Quran and then seeing how much uh, offense and oprim can be directed in his, uh, his way. Now look at verse 12, uh, verse 7. To keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Paul doesn't go out of his way to court weakness. Nor does Paul suggest that suffering and weakness is in and of itself good. Notice the thorn is described as a messenger from Satan. And we're not saying that Paul glories in suffering as if he's entered to some sort of higher trance-induced state of exuberance and just grins maniacally at the prospect of safe suffering. Hit me again, he says. I'm enjoying it so much. No, he prays three times earnestly to the Lord that it be taken away. Nor are we suggesting there's an automatic connection between suffering and weakness, and therefore wherever we find weakness and suffering, we can assume it is necessarily authentic ministry. Rather, God is in charge of all suffering and weakness. And the paradox of divine power is that he deliberately acts to ensure that we are weak, frail, inadequate, so that we remain dependent upon him. Now, as I say, if we don't grasp this, then we will never comprehend the everyday experience of Christian life. We won't be able to speak openly about weakness in ministry, or we won't understand it. And we'll never be content with genuine Christian ministry. You know, we'll always, like the Corinthian church, be looking around for something more eye-catching, something more impressive, something less rugged and run-of-the-mill. And we will never respond rightly to our weakness as we experience it. Rather than casting ourselves on the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you, we'll cast around elsewhere for a different sort of Christianity. Well, let's get down to the full speech for a moment or two, and let's run through it. I mean, it speaks for itself, really. 
but allow me to warn you that at the end of the talk, I'm going to be throwing out a little bit of a, a question for us to discuss later on through the morning, and I hope you will discuss it. And this is going to be the question. Would you have been happy going to a church led by the Apostle Paul? Or are you too worldly? Um, we saw last week that the Corinthian church is plagued by false teachers. They teach a different Jesus, a different gospel, and a different spirit. Of course, very dangerous because they did speak a lot about the Holy Spirit. And they did talk a lot about Jesus, and they did talk a lot about the gospel. So false teachers don't come to us with big neon lights flashing on their forehead, I am a false teacher, and they don't wear shirts announcing, I am a wolf. But as they spoke of Jesus, they spoke of a different Jesus. They brought a different message. They wanted to add to the message of the crucified Jesus, a finished work on the cross, extra works and extra experiences of the Holy Spirit, other than the experience of being justified and declared righteous through the cross. Now, we haven't got time to go back over that. You might like to download it and listen to it on tape. But it seems that the false teachers came using the style of the world in order to draw the Corinthians after them. And because the Corinthian church weren't clear on the paradox of divine power, they were won over by the style rather than checking out the substance. We're going to spend a moment or two on this because it's so important. First century Corinthian culture was wowed by clever speakers. Oratory was an art form in the Greco-Roman world. And in the world of Greco-Roman oratory, powerful, wealthy, impressive rhetoricians, speakers, fascinated crowds and won riches for themselves and friendship with the great through their verbal pyrotechnics, to quote one author. Another analysis of the culture, the very nature of the profession tended to produce a certain attitude of mind which placed emphasis on material success and on the ability to argue for any point of view irrespective of its truth. Sounds like Oxbridge. Or Professor Don Carson. In Corinth, a new city where social clim climbing and the love of status were the norm, Favorite orators were turned into heroes and audiences into fans. So that was the culture. Um, those of you who remember Angus Crichton, who worked here a number of years ago, he did his PhD in ancient Greek culture, and he pointed me to one orator of the day whose name was Lucius Vibilius Hipparchus Tiberius Claudius Atticus Herodes. You can just picture it, can't you? In the great stadium. This morning our speaker is. And then rattling off this great list of titles. William Taylor doesn't quite fit, does it? The bill. But it seems that, and you don't have to have read all that sort of stuff to make sense of it, it seems that the false teachers in Corinth came to Corinth with a style of ministry that aped the worldly Greek culture of the day, and that the Corinthian church was so worldly and unaware of the paradox of divine power that when they were presented with a preacher teaching Jesus, a different Jesus, speaking of the Spirit, a different Spirit, and when that person came to them using the worldly apparatus of the uh, speakers of the day, the first century Corinthian church couldn't spot what was wrong. So, from chapter 10, the false teachers criticize Paul for his physical appearance. You can see it in chapter 10, verse 10. His bodily appearance is weak, they said. And they criticize Paul for not speaking well. His speech is of no account, they said. And they criticize Paul for not conducting a ministry that was free of setbacks and that moved from one point of strength to another, chapter 10, verse 3, some suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So here were these false teachers. Look at Paul. He's, I don't know, he's got a stammer. He's not very clear. He's not a great orator. He doesn't draw a crowd. Look at Paul. 
He has to change his travel plans. He can't be walking in the Spirit. Look at Paul. He seems weak and fleshly. And at the same time, they elevated themselves. Chapter 10, verse 12. They commended themselves. They measured themselves by themselves and compared themselves with one another. And so the false teachers pushed themselves onto the Corinthian church by aping the style of the world, criticizing Paul and puffing themselves up. And the Corinthian church was so worldly and so divorced from the cross, as we see in 1 Corinthians, that they were unable to spot the problem. And so in the full speech, as it was read so well for us, beginning at chapter 11, verse 16, Paul is speaking with deep irony. Okay, you want some boasting. Of course, only fools boast, but allow me for a moment to do a bit of self-commendation, which is just what fools do, and allow me to boast for a moment. I'll show you what real Christian boasting is like. Deeply ironic, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I may boast a little. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool, because obviously boasting is such a wrong thing to do. Since many boast according to the flesh then, and seeing as you bear with them, let me boast for a moment. And then in verse 22 to 23, he lays out his Jewish credentials to show that he's just as Jewish as these Jewish false teachers, and he's got a sound pedigree and a solid CV. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And then in verse 23, he says, okay, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. And you can just imagine Paul's supporters in Corinth saying to themselves, at last, now he's going to do some boasting, and he's going to tell us of the churches he's planted, of the books he's written, of the um, conferences he's spoken about, of his global audience. And what does he do? With far greater labors, with far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I've been shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea, like Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic. There he was, just floating adrift on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the world, danger at sea, danger from false, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cup. That's real Christian boasting. Weakness, suffering, cross-light ministry. And interesting in verse 28, when it comes to uh, his ministry, sorry, verse 30, in his ministry uh, in Damascus, if I will boast, let me boast of the things that show my weakness. He went to Damascus to plant a church, and what did he do? Ran away. He had to run away. He had to flee for his life. Here then is our question, would we have gone to a church led by the Apostle Paul where the speaker appeared weak, where he wasn't the best orator, where in the kind of way of judging things of the world, you wouldn't give him a second look, where the ministry was frail. Oh, he taught the gospel but suffering, weakness, and sheer hard graft were the marks of the ministry. You might say, and you may think this is a bit flowery, but you might say, you know, the speaker on Sunday morning wasn't particularly gifted when it was Paul's turn to speak. The structure wasn't actually all that clear when Paul was on. The travel plans failed, and sometimes he simply failed to turn up because the plane was cancelled. And he did not march from one point of ministry success to the next. He tried planting churches, and the plans had to keep changing, and the venue was cancelled, and, uh, and then the whole thing seemed to be falling through the floor. Not that he gloried in suffering, not that he sought suffering, not that he saw weakness and suffering as itself good, necessarily, a, a messenger from Satan, and not that there's an automatic connection between suffering and weakness, and certain authentic ministry. But Paul seemed weak. 
Now, I think this is a hugely important lesson for us at this stage of our countries, and actually you would say the West's development. Um, over the summer, uh, we as a, a teaching team encouraged one another to read Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. It was written in 1985. And Postman's thesis was that with the, the, with the arrival of television, methods of communication have changed radically. He suggests that we have entered a world, this is 1985, remember, where instant rather than permanent, impression rather than reason, entertainment rather than serious discourse are the norm. As you read the book, uh, and those of you who have read it back in 1985, you can remember that far back, he does appear, uh, appear on occasion to be a slightly grumpy old man. I've no idea what age he was when he wrote it, and possibly that's why I found it's myself agreeing with it so often. But surely we have to say that Postman's thesis was right. That since 1985, we've entered a world of sound, bite, and spin, where politicians appear to be elected at least in part on looks and media appeal. Newscasters are employed on the basis of their ability to look good in front of the camera, and where the celebrity culture has taken over from an age of carefully reason, sustained logic in our public discourse. So then, like the Corinthians, we are wide open to false teaching, if that's the mood of the age around us. And as teachers come in aping the culture, unless we're very wary and mature and sensible, we will so easily be slept, swept away. And I think we have to say, as we look around at some ministries, that has happened. Now, it's never nice to, uh, to look around at other ministries, but I, Paul does, and he does so in order to guard the flock. Some of you will have come across, for example, Joel Olstein, Your Best Life Now, that has sold millions of copies around the world or here in London, Hillsong. Now, there's no doubt that their message is different to the authentic message of the New Testament. You will not hear cross-shaped living. If any man would come after me, let him take up his cross daily and renounce self, deny self. You will hear your best life now. But because all of this is presented in a style that is so deeply attractive and deliberately apes the celebrity culture of our age, hundreds, thousands of people have been taken in by it. Now, I've watched it on television on a number of occasions. The teaching style is anecdotal, short on substance, light on logic, full of self-referencing, stories that puff up the preacher, that do little to instruct the listener. And you have to conclude when you look at it, they've deliberately put the beautiful people at the front. Everybody seems to have perfect teeth that glisten white. And they're part of the beautiful celebrity world. And worldly Christians, rather than looking at the substance, buy it. Oh, it's easy to pick, point the finger, isn't it? Wouldn't it be easy at St. Helens for us to give the impression, by the way we speak, by the style of our ministry, in our presentation, that uh, it's successful, trouble-free, weakness-free, powerful Christian living that never experiences the setback and the pressure and the sadness and the grief and the hard work of authentic Christian ministry. Not that we glory in it. Not that we deliberately seek out weakness. Let's see how shabby we can make it. Let's see if we can really wreck the sound system so that we can make everybody really grumpy. And then they'll see what true Christian ministry is about. No, no, no. It wasn't all designed to help this sermon. No, we didn't try to. We try to get things right, and so do you. But there's a danger, isn't there? 
the church is full. And so to somebody who then goes to a, a ministry where there are 30 people li li living in little Snodgrove under the motorway somewhere, and the message is clear and cross-shaped, we think, oh, too weak, not St. Helens. Can't be right. And also, I think, because many of us are Stoics by upbringing, I, I know we're not all Stoics nowadays, but some of us were brought up to be relatively Stoical, like the man in the Battle of Waterloo. You remember the film, My Goodness, So You've Lost Your Leg? Oh, my goodness, so I appear to have done. Apparently, the leg became a tourist attraction in the village at Waterloo, and people went to look at it for weeks and months afterwards, the leg in question that he had lost. But there is a danger, isn't there? Being so stoical, we never talk about our troubles to anyone. Not that we should allow our guts to hang out on the table all the time publicly, but there is a danger. We're so stiff upper-lipped that we begin to think, actually, all ministry moves from success to success and forget that his power is made perfect in weakness. Personally, I'm delighted... Uh, to have taught the, the letter of 2 Corinthians for the first year that I was here. It prepared me for ministry at St. Helens. I, mean, I entered uh, into Christian work having only ever done Christian service in a really sort of concerted way at summer camps. And I think I thought back in the early 90s that all Christian ministry was conducted in a pair of shorts with a metaphorical surfboard under your arm. And I remember in that first year, as I began to experience what Paul is talking about here, looking at a postman one morning, and to my shame really, saying, I wish I was doing that job. Here at St. Helens, certainly in the first five or six years, roughly every six months, something would happen from which one said, will we ever recover from that? And every church plant we've ever tried to engage in has been a sequence of setbacks and difficulty. I mean, many of them are established, but we have to say, those of us who've been involved in them, it was only done through the grace of God. God deliberately keeps us weak so that all glory and power is self-evidently His. Now, one of my concerns over some of the most popular internet preachers that many seem very happy to listen to all the time. I've spoken about some of my theological reservations about one or two of them, but one of my concerns is that the style of ministry seems to ape the style of the world. And the preachers so often are self-referenced and speak about their buildings and their this and their the other and their speaking engagements and the, the particular why generation that they're so good at speaking to. It really worries me because it will open the door for their followers to less theologically astute preachers who use the same style in what do we boast. Now, very briefly at the end, with what are we content? Glance down at verse 10, and I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes chewing this over. Paul says, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions. See, if we don't grasp the paradox of divine power, we will never be content with real Christian ministry. I remember um, shortly after I started work here, a friend of mine moved to the Cotswolds to do ministry. And when things were particularly hard at various periods, I used to think to myself, how lovely for X in his Cotswold vicarage with the soft beige hue of the Cotswold stone and the collared dove cooing in a tree in the garden and so on and so forth. I wish I could be there. You see, lack of contentment. I didn't say to myself, God always works deliberately to keep his ministers weak so that X in his Cotswold vicarage will have rats in the attic or something like that to keep him on his knees. There is no such thing as stress-free, trouble-free, hassle-free Christian living. There is a purpose to it. God deliberately acts to keep us on our knees so that we will be able to say, His grace is sufficient for my weakness. If you don't see that, then you may embark on Christian leadership or ministry of any sort, from putting out chairs, serving coffee, 
helping an individual, going to visit somebody, teaching a small group, and as soon as the weakness sets in, you'll back away from it. Oh, I'm not going to engage in that. And if we don't grasp that, then we will actually remove ourselves and our families from authentic Christian ministry. It's not exciting enough. And in 10, 15 years' time, you won't want to line up with that sort of ministry. And you'll lead yourself away from it. As we take up the cross and deny ourselves, then we will experience resurrection power. But Christ was crucified in weakness. We also are weak in him, but we live by his power. Well, two Corinthian ministry was the result of one Corinthian theology. You'll see that this year. And as we study two Corinthians together, we will be driven back to the cross. Here's my question. Would you have gone to a church led by the Apostle Paul? Or are you too worldly? Please do uh, talk about it if you would. Uh, I mean, do ask all the other sort of things of people who are not inhuman. Find out about people. Welcome them to St. Helens. But do pause and ask, would you have gone to a church led by the Apostle Paul? I asked a question like that recently down in Yeovil and said, please talk about this afterwards. And a lovely old gentleman came straight up to me afterwards. I was expecting to hear something, you know, a question along the lines. He said, I brought a South Devon heifer from your father, an Exeter sale in 1985. So if you did buy a, a sheep or a pig or anything like that from any member of my family, look, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted you did. I'm really pleased, but I'm not actually that interested. Let's think, <laughs> shall we? Let's think about Christian ministry. Do you understand the paradox of divine power? Let's pray. I, am, am I going to pray or is Jamie going to lead us? I'll pray. Okay. Oh, Father, we thank you for teaching us this lesson again and again, from uh, writing it, for writing it into our heart. Many of us are in the midst of weakness. We're very conscious of our own frailty. We have experienced setbacks and difficulties. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful truth. My grace is sufficient for your weakness. And we pray that you would teach this lesson to us so that it lasts a lifetime, that even in our final years, we would find ourselves not looking for some other way out, but on our knees, content with what you've given to us, and finding your comfort, your strength, your enabling, your power in the midst of our frailty. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.